one document. So thank you. Okay, thank you um, to inviting me to this very exciting uh, day. I will talk about a reconstruction of an exhibition uh, from uh, 1972. Let me quickly. Uh, uh, this is a poster for the exhibition that took place in the Swedish Architecture Museum uh, in 1972. And the title of the exhibition is called um, how, uh, housing crisis and, and model homes, illusion and reality. A reconstruction of Gunnar Asplund's uh, home or one, one room home on the home exhibition at Lille in 1917. So why, uh, why reconstruct an exhibition in 1972? I mean, I think this, I mean, we are very now familiar with reconstructions of exhibitions, but in 1972, this, I, I haven't still found, uh, not at least in the Council of Navy context, an earlier example. Uh, there was, from the curators that you see here, is the um, Ingla Lind and Bengt and Johansson. They're standing here barefoot inside this reconstruction. Just in the, this is the day before the exhibition is opening. And they're giving the kind of last kind of uh, directions for how they should hang the curtains. And they claimed that they needed to reconstruct this uh, room, this exhibition room, to in some way go back and find the roots to the housing policies uh, in the Swedish welfare state. And also forming a critique of that. So it was necessary to go back to an exhibition room. And that I think is quite peculiar in some way why the history is an exhibition room. And I can ask ourselves, is the kind of uh, uh, the, the history of modern architecture, history of exhibitions. They also, in the kind of opening lines of the uh, uh, catalog, they say, why do we keep seeing this room in all overviews of Swedish modern, uh, uh, modern Swedish architecture? It's also quite a peculiar kind of thing because at the time, in 1972, it existed maybe one or two books about the history of Swedish uh, modern architecture. But in a way, they, they feel a kind of need to dismantle this kind of rule of this specific room uh, in both the history uh, uh, of uh, Swedish modern architecture. <coughs> and this is the room. Uh, uh, I should say a little bit about the original exhibition, even if I haven't researched the uh, original exhibition uh, from 1970, and just looking at that through the lens of 1972. Anyway. Uh, it was a very successful exhibition who, as many exhibitions at the time, 1970s, tried to connect in some way industry and uh, architects. And it was done to the um, um, Arts and Crafts Association. And they, in some way, put up a competition. Uh, and they presented in a kind of new, quite new um, exhibition hall, Lille a kind of series of model homes for the working classes uh, to create, in some way, the good housing. And Gunnar Asplund uh, was then at the time quite a young architect, not yet kind of uh, one of the big ones. Uh, and he won the competition in some way for doing the most, uh, uh, the smallest room. This was a one room uh, living with a kind of stove, where a family of seven should live in one room. Uh, and in some way this room uh, responded to the situation that most people were living in at the time. And Gunnar Asplund did this, uh, created the furniture and in a kind of vernacular stripped down style. And at the time that this room was, uh, people were amazed about it. Even if it was bigger, more bigger flat, this was the room that was most popular on the exhibition. And people uh, wrote about it and the reception of it was amazing. Everyone thought it was so cozy, this little neat room, everything on its right place the canary bird singing in the window, the neat pla uh, plants, the books on the table, and so on. It was kind of an ideal home of a neat little sweet home where everything is in the proper order. And this is the reconstruction done in 1972. 
as you maybe already seen, the, 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 uh, the furniture are slightly stripped down, a little bit simplified. But it was a very, very uh, extremely ambitious reconstruction. And one thought from the beginning that one should be able to find the original furniture. Uh, and they put in, the creators put in kind of advertising in the main papers. They didn't show up anything. They didn't find any material objects left from the exhibition. The, the idea was that this uh, <coughs> furniture should be put in production. They were never done put in production. Instead, the Arts and Crafts uh, Association issued kind of drawings of the furniture. And these drawings you could buy very simply, uh, very inexpensive. And you, the idea was that you should either build them yourself, this is the pre day to IKEA, or uh, have someone to, to do them for you. So they didn't have any kind of uh, material evidence left, except, and I want you to note, the, little, the, the china in the cupboard, especially that, little, uh, that you see in three dots, uh, little uh, pot, was uh, they knew exactly that that has been standing in the room. And they actually used that pot to get the measurements of the room. So this is the crucial kind of material uh, evidence left. And because they had problems with the height of the room. So what they had left in some of was just this photograph. And they based the whole kind of reconstruction on this photograph. Again, a problem with the part of the room that was, did not show in the photograph. So there they kind of speculated more widely. Uh, they knew, for example, the, about the stool, that it had been a ceramic stool there, and it was done by a specific company. But they didn't know, I mean, they did a mock-up here in Cluster, and they kind of, you know, did a slightly speculation. They, of course, approached people who had been on the exhibition, eyewitnesses. Uh, they went through the different kind of records, uh, also the, the kind of economic records from the exhibition. Uh, and here again, you see the kind of problem of uh, in this bit. They also didn't know anything about this cupboard. Uh, and then they kind of interview people at, you know, how, how was this, how did this, this specific one look? They reconstructed the furniture and they found out, uh, they went back and found to the records that the uh, producer of the furniture at the time. And it turned out that their son, uh, the son of the manufacturer had turned into interior designer. So they approached that interior designer and he got the kind of task to reconstruct the furniture. In some way, strange connecting back uh, to the original uh, kind of event in some way. And he did this kind of carefully drawing up, quite speculative quite often, from the photograph. Uh, and also drawing up the kind of room itself. They also identified, of course, the space where it had ex been exhibited from the beginning. And as they carefully note in the catalog, the room is 20 centimeter tighter, because to fit into the new place where they were exhibited. Uh, to do the reconstruction for the photographs, they kind of drew out the kind of furniture and did a kind of blue up, like here, all the time based on this little uh, pot that was also helping to give the size. There's a reconstruction. They also reconstructed uh, and very carefully looked into the which type of plants uh, the books, uh, the cushion, the, the canary bird, of course, all kind of carefully kind of uh, uh, remade. The lamp, uh, they also actually got the, the lady that had swept this lamp for Gunnar Asplund. She was still alive. And they got her in, and like a very old lady standing up on the table, wrapping this lamp again, nearly as a kind of reenactment. <coughs> Uh, the wallpaper, they also researched very carefully, trying to go back and find uh, the original uh, um, producer of the wallpaper, but that factory was dismantled. And instead, by luck, they found a kind of piece of the wallpaper in Villa Schnellmann, who was built just after the, uh, this exhibition. And then, uh, now we are in the Architecture Museum. And behind this kind of box, you can see that's this kind of very meticulous done reconstruction. And outside, it's reality. As you remember, the exhibition was called Illusion and Reality. And the argument of the exhibition was that the whole Gunnar Asplund proposal was an illusion. 
It was a, a kind of, uh, and, and the whole exhibition is very critical. Going back in some way, trying, there was an illusion that one could solve the kind of pressing uh, uh, housing situation with architecture. And Gunnar Asplund doing this kind of li neat little room was kind of fooling people in some way. And also they didn't have a reach out to the working classes. It was become like an idol for the middle class rather. So here the kind of happy lady who's been inside seeing this kind of very beautiful reconstruction comes out in reality. And here she gets to know in detail how the reconstruction has been done. Uh, they, they, you know, they explain very carefully that they just had one uh, uh, image and they ask the audience to help us to find the mistakes we've done. This is not about the, the illusion that we can reconstruct. They also ask, how was it actually working? And they show kind of images uh, in this very kind of counterculture way. They kind of did it very crappy. All the papers are very crinkly. They use this kind of uh, felt pen, pen all the time, uh, points and arrows and so on. This is also in the other exhibitions I've been looking at earlier in the museum. This is the strategy one work with. And asking in some way the question, how could one live in this room? A family of six to seven kids, one sofa, you know, how could you sleep, cook, uh, eat, make love in this room? And then juxtaposing this with these images as a time. And also uh, relating in some way to, to material from Le Corbusier, uh, how could you furnish this room? And then did you know that? And they give the statistics on uh, how people were living at the time. But also th this kind of strange uh, wrap round photograph is showing contemporary images of slum living. So all the time, this is also relating to the contemporary issue of housing. Putting it in a kind of political context and uh, uh, seeing, you know, how was the, the relationship to, what, what was the relationship to this exhibition and the ongoing political uh, conflicts at the time. And of course, the lady coming out has been very happy inside the exhibition. She also has, this is anyway 1972, she also had to work in the exhibition. She has a working task in Arbis Obift and asking what connection between this and Gunnar Asplund's uh, kitchen and the political happening, uh, polit political situation at the time. I've been very fascinated by this, uh, and this kind of contrast between this very meticulous inside reconstruction and the kind of rhetoric that goes on on the outside. Also aesthetically, that this kind of using purposely kind of crinkly paper, uh, some kind of counterculture aesthetics, uh, you know, purposely done very quickly and so on. I mean, the, the wallpaper inside is very, very smooth, and on the outside, the paper hardly hangs up. So, this is the interior again. As you see, this is the, the poster, as I show you. On here, you can also see the kind of argument of the exhibition. So I'm showing the room and the reality crashing through as a kind of collage, or is one of the photographs of, of from the uh, time. The, the creators warn all the time against the illusion of this. I mean, this is the, in the rhetoric in the catalog, but also in the material of the walls. You shouldn't be seduced by this room. Uh, this was just an illusion. But of course, it was very seductive at the time in 1972 also. And this kind of stripped down wood furniture, of course, echoes very strongly in Kia at the time, and it become also a, a very much loved room in 1972. Uh, the wallpaper got into production, uh, it got very popular, and um, this was also picked up by the general press, how we live now and then, and making a kind of a kind of room uh, similar to this of living in one room. I will conclude with just a kind of uh, reflection over what I've been doing in this, um, researching this exhibition, because I find myself in a very peculiar situation of trying to reconstruct a reconstruction. And now when I've been doing that, uh, the material is in the Architecture Museum. None of the furniture are left. Uh, they were given away to uh, Asplund family, and I've been trying to track them down, but haven't found them. Uh, and I'm working in some way with uh, these two brown boxes from the, from the institutional archive where I can look through and see through all the bills, the kind of movement of, of uh, the exhibition was touring a bit, 
the, the different uh, events that happen around the exhibition and so on. Uh, so again, in some way, the, the kind of material evidence left is just uh, in some way the scrap boxes and a set of drawings. Okay, thank you. seems like a bit of a violation to speak at an event that I have been organizing, but Mark explained to me these are the rules. And um, so um, and, and, and I'm going to try to go quickly. I'm talking about the 1972 uh, New Domestic Landscape Exhibition, which some of you know um, and have seen uh, uh, the presentation of at the, um, at the gallery here. Um, I'm returning to it in part because um, the exhibition, uh, Environments, Counter Environments, which dealt with the films from the 1972 exhibition, um, it just opened at the Graham Foundation in Chicago and we're struggling to pr finish uh, publication. So I had to get it back into my head and this seemed like a good opportunity. So I'm showing you a set of films um, that uh, uh, were recovered from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and as I said, were, were built, um, were produced to accompany the designed environments. And so I think most of you are familiar with the 72 show, but if you're not, let me say only that the exhibition introduced new Italian design to an American audience and famously exposed this design to a strict curatorial schema in which objects were made distinct from environments. And um, so these are objects and these are environments. And in which according to the logic of the exhibition, environments represented a more advanced form of design and social interaction and according to the curator, offered a corrective to some of the more superficial seductions of designed consumable objects. So um, let me begin. This is Ugola Pietra being interviewed by RAI outside of the new domestic landscape exhibition. A year after the closing of MoMA's acclaimed exhibition, Italy, the new domestic landscape, a turnstile jubilee in the words of its curator, Emilio Ambas, the fate of its most important artifacts remained undecided. The crates packing the environments that had been commissioned for the exhibition, designed by Joe Colombo, um, Super Studio, ArcaZoom, and other celebrities of Italian design, were being shuttled around MoMA storage. As the cost for another museum to mount the exhibition soared past half a million dollars, Ambas offered the options available. The environments could be returned to Italy if shipping fees were assumed by the fabricators, or they could be destroyed in front of the proper customs authorities. Equally uncertain was the future of the crates of mirrors and projectors that held Implicor, the exuberant audio-visual apparatus produced by the Italian design firm Olivetti. These crates found their way to a MoMA loading dock where they sat in quiet oblivion. In 1975, Emilio responded to a request from NASA to borrow the Implicor system, which he describes as follows. The room was made of specifically treated polarized mirrors, Behind the mirrors were 32 slide projectors, so the public could see itself reflected in the mirror, the image projected on it, as well as the image which was projected on the opposite walls. It was quite successful from a psychological viewpoint in involving the audience. Regretfully, we have taken it apart, and there's nothing that you can now see. If the dismantled Implicor system seems to predict its full entropic dissolution, this was confirmed a year later, when Emilio responded to UCLA that should they want to take possession of Implicor, they would need to replace most of the components as they had not fared well in storage. Finally, in July 1976, a memo from Arthur Drexler confirms their destiny. If we have no word from Jill Wintering of Olivetti by the close of business, business on Monday, July 12th, no further action on our part is required and we can dispose of the Olivetti Implicor system stored on the 53rd Street platform. Alas, no word from Jill Wintering arrived. The environment crates met the same fate. So while this story has its own pathos, I'm interested in what these crates represented for the exhibition and the museum, and what beyond shipping fees made them such ambivalent artifacts. Olivetti was a primary sponsor of the new domestic landscape, covering the costs of the exhibition's many audiovisual displays, with the exception of the environmental films, which I will return to shortly. Implacor was the third insertion of Olivetti design into the museum following 1952's Olivetti Design and Industry and Kiniston McShine's 1970 exhibition, Information. 
um, I'm showing you an, uh, a, a visual jukebox, which I'm going to talk about now. Information had installed the plastic hooded visual jukebox designed for Olivetti by Ettore Sazza's Jr., which at MoMA was used to display 10 different loops of post-minimal cinema as the centerpiece of the exhibition. As historian Eric de Bruyne notes, this was a rather infelicitous marriage of audiovisual technology and content, altering the cinematic scope of the films to a constrained private television encounter, neutralizing the performative model of the films, and as he argues, filtering it back into the spectacular system it first resisted. And this gives you some sense of how the visual jukebox works. And these are installation shots of it in Italy before um, it, at a trade show before it came to MoMA. If the jukebox was hampered by such a failure of performativity, the Implacore device clearly sought to overcome this limitation. Implacore formed the commentar commentary gallery in which issues raised by the exhibition were announced by speakers and by the shifting graphic projections of Umberto Bignardi. Implicor marked the evolution of Olivetti's industrial audiovisual ambitions and the honing of its rhetoric. In the trade literature, Implicor is described as an audiovisual system of total communication that achieves an unusual degree of audience involvement. The spectator has the sensation of complete identification of which he is now part. The system, they explain, is the outcome of modern research that lies between the spatial arts and the techniques of suggestion. If what we know of the subversive curatorial attitude of the new domestic landscape, um, for example, it's an exhibition of design artifacts that argues for the disappearance of objects, would suggest that it would be hostile to techniques of suggestion most identified with commercial adver advertising. Recall Emilio's letter to NASA in which he applauds Implicor's capacity to involve visitors and its psychological success. Indeed, Ambas seems to echo the Olivetti text, which reverberates with both a soft McLuhan-inspired notion of involvement and through its suggestions of identification with a psychological dimension and motivation. Tony Vidler aptly describes the 1972 show as an elision of the cybernetic, cybernetic and the psychedelic. I would add that Ambas's mobilization of environment is perhaps positioned less in relation to the psychedelic than it is framed through psychology more broadly. This association is distinctly legible in the reading list for the brief offer, offered the exhibiting architects in which the most densely cited reference is the proshansky idelson rivlin Compendium, Environmental Psychology, People and Their Physical Settings, a primary reference for environmental design programs and for behavioral design in general. I'm going to warn you now, if you don't have a taste for environmental design texts, you may want to leave the room. The, the stakes for the shift to environment and environmental design within the exhibition are described through questions of urban global calamities. Ambas posits that the process for achieving a resolution to compound and looming crises is through the design of environments as a problem-solving activity and as a counter-design that will affect structural changes in our society. As he infers elsewhere, this change requires a conception or design of environment that alters behavior. Indeed, the architects were asked to design not only physical, but psychological space. Beginning with domestic space, the environments allowed the exhibition to rethink possibilities of new relationships and configurations that, Ambas argues, would alter the social life of the family in order to affect social transformations outside the house. Spatially reconfigurable, the exhibition claims environments are then also socially, politically, and psychologically dynamic whereas objects are inert. If the most radical potential for the exhibition was the realization of environments that would alter behavior through a form of design that would supplement the political imaginary in Emilio's terms, the question of this behavioral transformation is the context against which the environmental films would register. Um, and so we're looking at a Zanusso Zapper installation with a monitor on which the films that were produced for the exhibition is displayed. The imperatives to design for new behavior and to design new behavior position the films as demonstration of the alterability of the environments, an alterability that the museum installation would not otherwise communicate. And as narration of what Ambas refers to as the rituals of new domestic relations. And these are some of the films that were produced for the exhibition by Colombo, uh, Peche, 
um, uh, Rosselli and uh, Torres Hatzes on the right. Strangely, despite the structural centrality, the films occupy a black hole in Ambaz's taxonomic system. They both exceed and drop out of his evaluation. They are supplemental in the sense that the promise of environmental activation of new behavior relies first on evidence of the possibility of this behavior. For Ambaz and the exhibition, the confluence of media, environment, and behavior is not only the site of communicative suggestion, but also of environmental pedagogy and instruction. Famously precocious, in fall 1966, having just graduated from Princeton School of Architecture the previous spring, Emilio Ambaz is, her, is hired to return as an assistant professor. The first course he teaches is a seminar on the theoretical study of environmental design, its techniques and methods. He continues this vein of research with an almost obsessive dedication while at Princeton, Carnegie Institute, and as a guest speaker at Ulm. A year later, now also the Associate Director for Research at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, he is co-author of the Institute's prospectus that includes an environmental design evaluation and education program. Curiously, the target for this program is not the institute itself or other schools, but museums. The prospectus proclaims that the program would act as an environmental design information agency for a federation of museums, and that the institute will act as both a coordinating and production body for the Museum of Modern Art, the Stedlich, the Walker Art Center, and the Tokyo Museum. The prospectus describes that the mechanism, mechanism of environmental education sorry, of environmental education would be new approaches to curating and new techniques of display and communication. The following year, Emilio, at 26, still precocious, is appointed associate curator of design at MoMA, and his project shifts to the interior of the museum, is manifest through a research program on industrial design in, in Latin America, through the Universitas Symposium, and also then through the new domestic landscape as the exhibition realization of a peculiar topological inversion that inserted the institutional, instructional exterior within the galleries of the museum. So while its modular sofas, plastic chairs, and total furnishing units are clearly exotic imports, Italy's new domestic landscape is also emphatically American. It is the American domestic landscape, formed within a set of institutional spaces and propositions for which Italy is merely a test case, an object through which the education of environment, environmental coding, and instruction can be demonstrated. For Ambaz, environmental design is a shibboleth for the reformation of institutions and for their social, political, ecological capacities. It is also a term that evinces a preoccupation with communication, invisible messages, intended and unintended forms of spatial suggestion, and their effects on perception, psychology, and behavior. The instructional dimension of the museum shifts from the consolidation of taste, value, and formal aesthetic lineage of objects to instruction about the social, psychological potential of design environments and environmental design for which media systems are the privileged form. But what of the sad fate of the crates on the 53rd Street loading dock? What type of documents and remains were they? In part, the museum's ambivalence mirrors the devaluing of Ambaz's introduction of an instructional instructional environmental design agenda within the museum. As the environmental Im imaginary that haunts Ambaz's earlier projects wanes, so does the value of the crates themselves. The implications of the new domestic landscape eventually give way to Ambaz's first monographic exhibition on the architect Louis Barragon, just as the crates are sent to the junkyard. They are the residue of the end game of environment as a counter-institutional practice. When Given the short circuit of power, finance, and influence between the Institute and MoMA, which is the spark that illuminates Emilio's early project, it might appear easy to predict this outcome. This is to say that what shifts is not only the value of those crates, but also a wider institutional acceptance of his notion of environment as a spectral, communicative, behavioral apparition of some order beyond plastic form. If the exhibition demarcates an insertion of the theoretical speculation of the seminar and the Institute's Education Federation to the museum, it is not only this insertion that seeds to some other program, but also the institutional topology of which it was evidence. For Ambaz and his fellow travelers, environmental design was within architecture, 
a subspecies of architecture, and at the same time outside. Its debates fixated on the outside of design, on the city, on social relations and habits that are conditioned by post-technologies, feedback cycles that are found at the ever-expanding perimeters of architecture. So it is an interior that is, one, is not one of autonomous form, but an interior in which one finds oneself simultaneously outside looking back at the receding, diminishing object of architecture, an object that diminishes in relation to the expanding universe of environments and environmental design, but that also diminishes in authority. It is an object whose formal constitution, compositions, and regulations cede authority and disciplinary importance to the lines of force that connect objects and spaces and that underwrite the production of new environmental forms, associations, and linkages that aim to unbalance the un interior of architecture, even as they seek the certainty of architectural regulations, uh, which in Ambas's case, and in, new, in the new domestic landscape, was an attempt to rewrite an object code or an architectural code as an environmental code. But in the end, the crates on MoMA's loading dock were not so much the safeguards of this recoding as they were the exhibition's disposable coda. Thank you. So I know it's late, yeah, but uh, I think uh, if you have a little energy, bear with me. My talk is also a little about lateness, so <laughs> it might be appropriate. Yeah, a while back, uh, oops, how does, a while back, I had a late night conversation with Mark Vasuda at a New York dance club, in which I was, in which I passionately tried to persuade him that cheese app should actively start assigning students research tasks that engage the history of the dance club. I made the argument that this is a grossly overlooked aspect of the history of spatial experiments, particularly in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and of course, from then onward. I tried to convince Mark that the symbolic as well as the material structure of the dance club in all its festive exuberance and everyday tackiness its clandestine ephemerality and glossy presence offers a utopian spatial blueprint that might be as worthy a subject of architectural study as exhibits at world's fairs and airport terminals. To study it not as a nostalgic exercise for pleasures past, but to study it as a uniquely constructed space that offers an outside to the everyday and is therefore full of paradoxes. But as far as I know, our animated conversation went without consequences here, which was probably due to its late night timing, our mutual intoxication, or the inappropriateness of my case. But why am I bringing up this anecdote? When invited to present here, I've been asked to speak as a visual artist, to present, as Mark generously put it, any one of my projects. I assume that this open invitation was due to my artworks and shows often engaging historical subject matter in the context of the exhibition. The relation between a historical document, whatever that might be, and how it speaks in a contemporary presentational context has been of continuous concern in my practice. Therein, the notion of display has always been a leitmotif, specifically display's function as a condition of imaging, how the way something is presented generates that very something. Transposed into the realm of historical engagement, this would read, how does the way one presents a document produce the history it supposedly is a sign for? One of the histories I have engaged in recent work is that of the rural commune movement in the US counterculture of the 1960s and 70s, a history of utopian community building that has been profoundly documented from the get-go in mainstream photo magazines, as well as in academic sociology seminars. At the time, it must have seemed that there were few things more photographic than young people in the pasture, and few social constellations seemed to be more easily modeled as a micro-society in time than the country commune. When engaging with that history from the perspective of a contemporary artistic practice, I specifically decided to bypass the abundant documentary trail of photographs and oral histories, 
Rather than to capture and to caption, I decided to look for and generate images that display this emerging social body through its structural features, relations, abstractions, by means of its implicit formal vocabulary. The questions asked were how to trace and project the connective tissue that, con uh, that constitutes togetherness. Does the social have a form? Are there rules that generate that form? I was interested in a formal language as an image of the social, a social abstraction in the form of instable diagrams, an image of an absence. Over the course of the last, of the last year, I started to extend that interest into the seemingly disconnected, if not contradictory, subculture that is rooted in the dance club. However far the two cultures may be, my interest in the representability of an ephemeral collective space and its associated events seemed enough of a connection to warrant the pursuit. What is a dance club? What defines a club night? And how does the temporary community that it forms come into being? How, what does architecture mean in that space of darkness? How can the exuberant affect generated therein be represented in ways other than nostalgic remembrance and blurry photographs of ecstatic dancers? What are the various underpinnings that guide such an event? Does affect have a structure? And is affect something that can be displayed in the realm of abstraction? What is a document in that context? And how can a document speak to that abstraction? My interest in the subject of the club and its dance parties has been a long time coming. Although I've always been a dance music aficionado, it had been a private passion existing outside of my art practice, a collecting and listening endeavor that produces nerds rather than exhibitions. But at some point, my questions about the relationship between the social and abstraction uh, closed the gap between these public and private forms of historical research. They are, after all, both about documentary remains. When, years ago, I started reading about the history of New York's downtown clubs, I quickly became fascinated with one particular narrative, which is the story of The Loft and its host, David Mancuso. What came to be known as The Loft started on Valentine's Day, 1970, as a private rent party hosted by David Mancuso in his second floor loft on 647 Broadway, just north of Bleecker Street. Mancuso had been a regular at the East Village's Electric Circus and Fillmore East, where, among, among other things, he attended lectures by Timothy Leary and witnessed the Joshua Light Show. By 1970, he had gathered a wealth of countercultural experiences and wanted to create a communal space for listening to records and to dance. The inaugural event at his loft was announced on handmade flyers featuring the words Love Saves the Day, and a visual reference to Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Memory. Mancuso started to play records as a way <clears throat> of communicating with his guests, sensing and responding to the atmosphere in the space. His music playing sent the guests on a sonic journey in which, quote, time went into a symbolic reverse, and the dancers became a collective moving in, quote, experimental regression. Dancing at the loft was, as a regular put it, quote, not a means to sex, but what drove the space. The loft gathering became a weekly feature, although they remained a clandestine affair, since Mancuso did not have a certificate of occupancy or a cabaret license, nor did the building have officially sanctioned fire exits. Mancuso constructed an, an environment that was defined by a unique combination of space, music, decor, drugs, and dance. Never mind the obvious ingredients, such as helium-filled balloons and streamers, fruit juices and snacks, a disco ball, and a high-quality sound system, the loft would soon enough become the blueprint for a new kind of communal space out of which the New York Downtown Dance Club should emerge. The loft on 647 Broadway lasted until mid-1974 when continuous harassment by the police led to Mancuso lose his lease. After a 17-month hiatus, Mancuso reopened the loft in his new home 
on the ground floor and basement of 99 Prince Street on an all but vacant block at the intersection of Mercer Street. This time, he got a certificate of occupancy in public assembly, but kept running it as an invitation-only party that didn't sell alcohol in order to be beyond state interference. Meanwhile, disco fever had swept the city. Novel and fully developed clubs defined an exploding cultural movement driven by extravagant interiors, celebrity appearances, and virtuoso DJs mixing a soundscape from the abundance of disco record releases that flooded a newly emerging market. At the loft, however, Mancuso stayed focused on his basic ingredients of spatial simplicity and perfect sound in order to offer a unique sonic experience for a devoted community of dancers. Quote, the whole party atmosphere was incredible. It wasn't a club, it was a family thing. You were going into somebody's living room. There were no outcasts. The crowd was very mixed. You could find somebody who was 50 years old partying next to an 18 year old like me, end quote. Although he kept upping his sound system to one of the purest in town, Mancuso stayed away from the emerging trend of mixing records. His focus was on the sonic space, the records themselves, as well as their sequencing created. He played each record from beginning to end, quote, even if it was 15 minutes long, no mixing, no disturbance. The record finished, you'd applaud on to the next tune. It wasn't about trying to impress with mixing, it was about music. To return to the question at hand, how can one exhibit a space that is not materially defined, a history that is built on the sensorial, an atmosphere defined by affect? What are the documents that remain? Hardly any photographs exist of the loft, as photography was strictly discouraged in order not to interfere with the journey that the dancers were sent on. This was, after all, not a celebrity club not Studio 54 with gossip column reporters lingering outside the door. Researching the loft led me time and again to the music played there, to its significance, to songs that came to be labeled as loft classics. I started hunting for these songs using best of lists in disco literature, music compilations that people had assembled, published, or posted online. What felt like moonlighting as a pleasure detective done late at night in, with no connection to my artwork, morphed into a larger series of songs assembled into a playlist. Following that trail, I realized that the information I was gathering would enable me to sonically piece together not only songs played at the loft, but a sequence of songs on a specific night. Many of the fragments I was putting together turned out to be of the same night. Further research clarified the date for which I was assembling the list to be June 2nd, 1984. And that date should turn out to be the very last night of the loft at its home on Prince Street. By then, I had assembled a playlist of about eight hours in length, and listening to it became quite a commitment. When connecting the dots, the foundational quality of the loft for the history of the dance club, the sequential nature of how music was played there, it being the last night of its Prince Street iteration, and of course the year 1984, I could not help but shift my relation to this collection from passion only to passionately professional. And last night began as an art project. 1984 was the year music went from analog to digital, the year of the Macintosh computer, 1984 was the year that Soho real, Soho's real estate fortunes turned. 1984 was the year that the HIV retrovirus was identified and AIDS began to dramatically alter New York's downtown culture, never mind George Orwell. Further detective work allowed me to complete the playlist, except for two entries that still remain unidentified. The list includes 118 songs in sequence, the overall playing time amounts to approximately 13 hours. What has become last night is a sonic trail of an ecstatic journey through a particular night at a particular historical moment. It started around 10 p.m. on June 2nd, 1984, 
and continued on until almost noon of the next day. The journey marks an ephemeral space in time, a space of collectivity and emotion that is guided by a sequence of songs. The journey begins slow, establishes an atmosphere, becomes a rhythmic language. It builds momentum, sonically, rhetorically, spatially, and affectively. It gets exuberant, reaches peaks. At some points, it slows down, rests, or drifts. But then momentum is regained, the traveler taken into a different realm, and further peaks are reached. About 11 hours in, one can sense a change that is ushered in by an almost spiritual dispersion of energy, followed by a shift in concentration and a turn away from playing songs to playing whole sides of albums. We have reached the fade out and are slowly going through the clean up state of the mind and of the space. Closure is imminent. Sometime around 11 in the morning, the journey concludes with two short songs, America is Waiting and Mia Culpa. What kind of document is this list? Starting with Love Has Come Around and concluding with America Is Waiting and the cheeky Mia Culpa. What does this ghostly scaffold around an architecture of the night present? What does it document? What does it represent? A rhythmic journey, the rhetoric of love, an exuberant space, pleasure at a crossroads, a utopian community, a moment in time, something lost, something gained, last night and last night. Perhaps this document seduces one into feeling closeness with the history it chronicles while continuously insinuating the distances to the actual <coughs> event. It simultaneously closes and opens the gap between personal experience and collective memory. Last night is an index for longing and mourning and what lies beyond. Making memory persistent it is a document that bends not only time, but maybe also its capability for representation. The list presents the authority of the archive while pointing to the limits of archiving. It points to the pleasure in and beyond the archive. Its accuracy in a realm that is anything but accurate builds a paradoxical bridge between structure and desire, between abstraction and affect between form and the social. The list is the heart of the project that is last night. It is an instable diagram that points to an image between images, a document as an absence. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Everybody gets a free drink, though. That <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm just going to ask, actually, one general question and then open it out to the audience, because I think these were four really exceptional projects. Um, and I love, um, Martin, your comment about the connective tissue of the social, um, uh, because I think that's very much um, one of the things that actually relates to all of the projects, which in some way deal with issues around reenactments and also the question of the limit of the archive. And so I thought it was a very apropos ending. And I think you know, we just saw a presentation that was about a shooting, literally shooting a gun, but also shooting the camera. Uh, literally the reconstruction of an exhibition, the question um, both of, a re uh, of, of the um, disposal of an exhibition, but also um, the, the question of the reformation of a content of an exhibition, right? Um, and what it actually would produce both as, as document, but also in terms of the content of the exhibition itself. Uh, and then this question of the dance club and, and the reenactment and recreation of, of that environment. Um, but one of the things I thought that was also very interesting in terms of the limits of the archive was the way in which try, your attempts to try to reconstruct these also expose the institutional apparatuses in a way that also, um, um, both institutional and social structures that also create 
you know, this kind of space of the institution and also the suspension of, of time that allow the exhibition to exist. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the ways in which in, in, in trying to reconstruct and reenact, you know, that, that, that process was also drawing in many, many, many different players, peoples, institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's addressed to me? Uh, it's addressed actually to me. Uh, yeah. yeah. uh, in terms of my project, like the one thing I've very early on decided, like absolutely against, because I think it would be, uh, to pick up a word that was mentioned, a folly, yeah, which is to reconstruct or restage what that last party actually was, yeah, because like one can assemble the music that was played, yeah, but uh, listening to it is something very different than uh, a club night, yeah, so it's like the paradox that I was after is that you on one hand you can actually have an accurate document, yeah, of what uh, was heard at that, in that uh, evening, yeah, but you can never, even like playing that, does not translate into a reconstruction of what that is, yeah? And that paradoxical relationship is one of the things that I've been like persistently interested in my practice, yeah? Yeah. Um, Mark? The, um, well, you know, the, the exhibition we produced was subconsciously not a reconstruction, but it was a way of using an exhibition as a reading tool, how, how you would use one exhibition to read another, which is a strangely recursive device, but it turns out is absolutely fine. <laughs> that that the, the, certain, the artifacts that you focus on um, develop their own, or you develop for them their own curatorial project, but they also, um, I think similar to the way Martin has described, they, they help write their own history of their reception as they're being exhibited. And, and what we looked at and what I spoke about was the specific status of those films, which at some level seemed overlooked in the initial exhibition, but in our reading turned out to be the most <coughs> pivotal artifacts within. And, and so in a sense, the documentary remains for us were not just those films that had disappeared, but the entire curatorial logic that seemed to unravel once we pulled on them. Um, and, and, and so part of the question for us then was the, the status of those documents as not just as, let's say, inert art, uh, archival objects, but as active agents that would, re would compel us to rethink the entire logic of museum modern art at that time. Uh, for me, this is a really important question, the question of the, the, the limits of the archive and the, the, the way it reveals a type of institutional social structure, because in this particular work, um, that, that's something that sort of happened uh, in the process of trying to reconstruct this, this photograph, because, I mean, as was said before, that every document has only a partial claim on the event, uh, and it's fragmentary, and... Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea that, that um, you know, when it becomes a monument, when, when the document becomes a monument, that happens in many different ways, but one of the ways in which it happens is it goes into a museum, it becomes art, and, you know, we tend to associate monuments with art. You know, their sculptures, their, at least, you know, as architects, you know, their buildings. Something happens. But the monument, you know, that, is meant to recall a lesson, but if what if the lesson is not? We don't know what the lesson. What's the lesson of that night? I mean, you know, <laughs> where, you know, who knows? And and, and <laughs> yet and yet, you know, there, so there's a loss. The lesson is lost, uh, but we try to reconstruct it, and and that's what I'm, you know, we presuppose there must have been a lesson, and I think that's sort of the limit of the archive. That can we ask another question? I mean, does an archive always sort of um, uh, invoke that question of lessons or lesson giving or, you know, the, the teaching dimension, you know, are there documents that are not teaching documents that are not sort of moral, you know, uh, lessons. In the case of this photograph, I was really, you know, the minute I started unpacking this, trying to put it together, how did he do it? All of a sudden the military industrial complex goes, you know, yeah. um, and MIT, it's role in it, and, and so on and so forth. So, 
Um, it's an uneasy thing, but you can't avoid it. But I think this question of can we, you know, how to approach that document without having to, to see all that histor historical unpacking as a lesson, yeah. you know, I think it's... It, yeah, I mean, in my case, maybe it's less abstract, but, but I think it's really interesting that a very young architecture museum, I and mean, the architecture museum in, in Sweden opened in 1962. It's, that's, that's a very early example of an architecture uh, museum dedicated to 20th century architecture. And they decide, and they have some kind of urge to reconstruct this kind of room that has a kind of myth around it. And uh, I, I think that that's the kind of urge, the desire to do that is really interesting. And I see also what the, I mean, the, the, this exhibition was exceptionally expensive compared to the other exhibitions done before. Raising the money, putting in the energy to do it also was, was uh, massive in comparison to other things. And then by ha having done that, it's also fascinating how little is left of it in the institution. So they haven't kind of memorized that at all. So quite quickly, the furniture you know, was distributed. It was a kind of issue, of course, of this furniture if they, I mean, they are, uh, and also the drawings are not listed under Asplund, of course. They're listed by Bloomberg, this kind of guy who got in to do the reconstruction in some way. So they, they, they get authorized in some way. Uh, they get it altered, but they, they, you know, there's something, you know, you do and you throw it out. I mean, can I, uh, yeah, uh, uh, with uh, Martin, I mean, I just, this is not a question, but as you were going through that playlist, that, what I thought, you know, was, I, w I started becoming nostalgic, yeah. <laughs> you know, of all, because I knew some of those songs, I think most of us know mm -hmm. those songs, I mean, you started to play them in your mind, and then some images start popping up, so, you know, they're, they're really, I mean, it's amazing how very little you have to give to, mm -hmm. to, to trigger that. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things in this relationship of <clears throat> like asking questions about ab abstraction and like a memory and uh, like a social connective structure. So yeah, and like how an image can actually be created from something that is so far beyond imaging. Yeah, the playlist is the socially connective structure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think is that word playlist? Is that was that? That's in a circulation in 1984. No, that wasn't. Ah, yeah, that's that's like a there. yeah, new right. bird. So you're you're actually you're putting together a bunch of songs and thinking of it yeah. in very contemporary. Terms I mean, thinking also like about the playlist as a form. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's like a form that has emerged. Like I don't know with Apple's iTunes right. maybe. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you when did he open a lot? Uh, 1970. 1970. So all of these sort of moments are almost simultaneous. Mm -hmm. 70, 72, 70. And they're all sort of pointing to, um, they're all seemingly also pointing to moments of some sort of political and urban crisis. I mean, why do you think these sort of challenging uh, exhibitions, reconstruction spaces are actually happening at that moment in, you know, I mean, I mean, I could, I could start saying that. I mean, the whole kind of project that I'm looking, I mean, I'm looking into the kind of uh, early exhibitions in the Architecture Museum uh, in Sweden. And that, of course, is to try to understand, I mean, using in some way this exhibition as a kind of prism to understand the changing rule of architecture and the architects in the post-war Sweden. And I mean, those exhibitions are all dealing with trying to, to kind of uh, criticizing in some way the welfare state and, and seeing that as a kind of uh, crisis in some way. So yes, of course, it, it, it's, it's important that this happens in 72. And it's also, I think it's quite amazing that it's not about the selling, I thought very much when I should go into this material that uh, the whole museum should be a kind of canonizing machine at that point, you know, to, to do the canon of, of, of uh, Asplund and so on, but it's not actually yet. It comes later in the 1980s, but at this period it's rather trying to go back in history and dismantle it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that. I don't know why he shot this in 1963. Um, you know, I th he was, it was his 60th birthday, um, he maybe was having some, yeah. you know, <laughs> fun for his 60th birthday. No, yeah, no, for some reason I thought that was, that was also his You know, yeah. what to do on my birthday? Uh, what to do on my birthday? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. But I mean, I could begin to, I mean, 63 was also in the, in the session that I was moderating, 
an important date. Um, and I was thinking of, oh my God, you know, it's like everything that, and the Catholicism of the session that I was in, you know, ev everybody had a Catholic reference somehow beginning with the hand and uh, there were a number of churches, you know, the Spanish pavilion was a type of church. And of course it was the, the, the pop, pop art, but also pop church. I mean, in 63 you had the Vatican II, which was the, you know, opening up of the church and breaking down of the Latin form and all, all these kinds of things. So that I find very interesting. I mean, there is a sort of, um, th there, there are, there are sort of institutions that, that inhabit the works without necessarily hosting or literally being the, the sponsors of work. Yeah. You know, they sort of pervade certain types of, of works. Yeah. Um, so that, that I, I find difficult to get at when it's not obvious, you yeah. know. Uh, but it's really also very important, I think, to, to unpack. Yeah. No, I think it was really um, Martin, Mark, and Thordis. Your, those, those events seem to be yeah. happening in 72 yeah. at a moment, both of urban political social crisis, yeah. right, mm -hmm. which is requiring certain ways of understanding both space and time, which maybe gets back to the beginning. Yeah. So for some reason, I was putting Edgerton back into yeah. uh, the, the 70s, but I think there's something really <laughs> curious about that moment in terms of what these exhibitions yeah. are actually asking of their, their audiences. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think for the new domestic landscape case, it's very clear that they're, I mean, they're trying to explain why it's lodged precisely in the moment of the early 70s. But I keep, just we're about to wind up, I suspect, I keep coming back to Wasif's, Wasif's great and weirdly troubling definition of an exhibition earlier today as something that arrests all of the movement around it. And mm -hmm. And it, it seemed like when we were talking about the exchangeability, the fungibility, the circulation of archives, and, and, and what was happening within SALT as a research institution, the, the exhibition was the moment in which everything stopped for a second, stopped moving. And, 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 uh, and I think this is why you s raised the question of its duration, because how, it's not how long does the exhibition last, but how long does it stop moving, or how long do you arrest that space before it needs to become something else. I mean, at least that's the way I was hearing it. Which made me think the opposite. If, if that's one way of reading an exhibition, is something that stops the incessant movement of archives and documents, what does an exhibition activate? How, rather than thinking about it as arresting something, what can we say that it activates? Which, for the New Domestic <laughs> Landscape Project, that, that seems to be really puzzling. Because it's, I think it's clear what it arrests it arrests all kinds of, um, I think it arrests the way in which environment enters the museum. It in part participates in the arresting of environment as a social political project. It mutates into something else at that point. Whether it's a historical coincidence or whether it has an effect is, un is totally unclear. I don't know how you map the consequence of an exhibition. But I, but I think that moment of the early 70s is, it, I mean, maybe it's just historical accident that the exhibition finds itself there, or maybe it participates in producing something, producing a new registration or a new reading or a new form of reception. Mm. I mean, I think like one of the, I want to sort of reread a line that I had in my text where I said like <coughs> sort of how the way one presents a document actually produces the history it supposedly is a sign for. Yeah, so I think. There's like one thing about these like coincidences between like all our talks, yeah, which might be sort of just like by chance, yeah, but I think uh, there's a certain relationship of like making <coughs> histories, yeah, in terms of actually like sort of certain things being archived, us having access to it, mm -hmm. us having like a certain uh, generational distance uh, to it, yeah, which it's almost like the, the life of a building, like 25 years later you can actually look at something has been archived and you can actually look at that. And I would like speculate that maybe for like 10 years later or 20 years later we can find similar coincidences, yeah, between things that somebody in 10 years from now might be looking at in, the, in a similar way, yeah. So it's like, I think it's a condition of, of archiving and looking at archiving and a condition of uh, presentation, yeah? And how presentation generates then those narratives.
Good. Well, I, I think we have exhausted <laughs> ourselves and everyone here. Yeah. It, it turns out it's impossible to pack an entire so full day conference into an afternoon. But, um, but we tried, and I, I think we did a valiant effort. Um, so thank you all for those of you who are still here, and thank you to all of the speakers and the moderators. Uh, uh, really incredible um, afternoon of talks, which will get expanded over dinner immediately. Thank you. <laughs>